And welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the busy intersection of faith and reason. I'm Doug Keck, working the front gate this week. And uh, remember, your questions are very important to us, so email them to us at Spitzer's Universe, one word at EW10.com. You can check out one of the myriad uh, websites Father Spitzer has created, magiscenter.com, incrediblecatholic.com, and purposefuluniverse.com. And be sure to check out the EW10 On Demand page and the EW10 YouTube channel where you'll find Father Spitzer's Universe. So if you missed anything, you want to go back over what got said, you can check it out there. And while you're there, look, there's so many other programs, thousands and thousands of hours of programs available 24-7 through, through an app, on the web. Check it out on our, our website. It really is invaluable, especially in this world and day and age when we're all on the move, as they say. This week, How the Devil Works. That's what we're talking about from Father's book, Christ vs. Satan, in our daily lives, which I'm assuming you already have. If not, check out our religious catalog to find out more about it. Also, our book of the month, You Shall Stand Firm, Preserving the Faith in an Age of Apostasy, by the very powerful speaker, Father William Casey, of the Fathers of Mercy. And uh, he doesn't... Uh, he doesn't give any mercy to some of the people who, who need to be talked to in this book. So if you like material like that, check this book out. Now we turn to the West Coast for the very merciful Father Robert Spitzer and ask Father uh. Spitzer to uh, pray for us and especially keep in our prayers everything that's going on in Eastern Europe and the Ukraine. Absolutely. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us. We ask in a special way this day that you watch out over the people of Ukraine. Ask that you might uh, uh, keep them uh, resilient, to keep them in their faith as they uh, struggle uh, to maintain a peace with dignity. Ask you also, Lord, to um, send your Holy Spirit down upon Doug and myself, our whole crew and audience this day, so that everything we do and say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We ask all of these things through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we just wanted to mention, because uh, so many people have inquired through EWTN about how they might be able to help those people in Ukraine, uh, whether they be refugees or not. And uh, we, we'd like to recommend the Knights of Columbus, of course. They have it. It's the Knights of Columbus Aid for Ukraine. And you can go to kofc.org forward slash Ukraine, kofc.org forward slash Ukraine. Uh, and that's a great way uh, and, and a good organization that you can count on and trust to, to do right with your, your money, uh, especially at this point in time. We'd only recommend somebody we knew who would do the right thing. So check that out, kofc.org forward slash Ukraine. So between all the stories in the headlines, recently there was a story that popped up it had to do with baptism. Uh, there was a story about, I guess, a particular priest in Phoenix where uh, apparently he was mm -hmm. saying we instead of I, and yeah. uh, that was a problem. And then, of course, the Associated Press kind of goes, uh, you know, just because the incorrect wording, you know, what's really the deal? There's, you know, kind of an attack on uh, being overly ritualistic. But there's a reason why it really matters whether it's I or mm -hmm. we, correct? Correct. I mean, uh, um, the, the church at some point has to enforce its rubrics mm -hmm. because if it doesn't, in one second, that rubric will become the Lord only knows what. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it just, uh, I mean, it could just evolve over the course of a day into something you wouldn't even recognize as a baptismal formula. And so the idea you mean like is like creator, the, redeemer, and sanctifier? Or yeah, one of those yeah, versions? Exactly. Yeah, right, exactly. Right, right, right. I mean, or worse. Or right, worse. Right, right. And so of course, uh, you know, the uh, we could get the the, the you know the monophysite blessing, mm -hmm. the non Trinitarian blessing, the Unitarian blessing, whatever we might get, but it might not be the baptismal formula that we get in the Acts of the Apostles or that we get at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. So the first thing that we have to do is um, the church has to make sure that its rubrics are adhered to because after
after all, a sacrament is uh, a supernatural grace, but it's coming under a, so a sign, right, which is of uh, some earthly character. And part of that sign is not just the water of baptism, but it's the words of baptism and the priest who is administering it or the minister, the deacon, the minister who is administering mm -hmm. it. And, of course, a lay person could administer baptism in a time of, uh, you know, extreme that, that or there's uh, mm -hmm. some, um, you know, uh, lack of a minister, appropriate minister for baptism. So all of these things being the case, the church does have to, to, to watch out over its, its uh, rubrics, and, and um, so I don't blame them at all. And then you mm -hmm. say, well, uh, if you're going to do that, well, then what happened to all those people who went to confession to that priest? God is not going to hold uh, you know, if a person went to confession and he meant to be forgiven and to receive absolution from someone who is uh, ordained properly, mm -hmm. God is not going to say, aha, legal technicality, you did everything right, but that priest was not validly ordained, and therefore you've got no absolution and you're right back to base one. Mm -hmm. This, you know, obviously we have a definition of mortal sin where you have to have sufficient reflection and full consent mm -hmm. of the will. I mean, does a person have full consent over, of the will over an act which got done 20 years before and he has no idea about, nor does the actual um, administering priest have any ordain, mm -hmm. uh, any idea about. Of course you can't be held responsible and you're, you know, the, basically if you went there with sincerity, God is going to honor that um, in some way. So, uh, you know, that's, first of all, mm -hmm. of course you want to go back, you want to say, I was one of these people that, um, you know, was... Uh, uh, received absolution from this priest multiple times, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the the point is, of course, th there there is uh, provision made for our ability to know and our sincere desire to receive from you know a, a validly consecrated minister. Mm -hmm. And so there's all kinds of provisions that are made in canon law to. Um, uh, to provide for those situations. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, does the church have a right to, to do this? Yes, the church has the right to, to, to do it. And the church has to do it. Like mm -hmm. I said, you, you'd you never recognize the baptismal formula. You just give it a week, and then mm -hmm. it'll evolve right. into whatever anybody wants it to be. I mean, after all, we live in a society where you can declare your own gender tomorrow. Absolutely. So, uh, no matter what your biological status is. So, um, yeah, I mean... Uh, you can bet on the fact that um, there would be nothing left of the church's sacraments uh, within a week. Considering if they didn't have the right, right to considering we live in a world where everybody quibbles over pronouns, like you said, like she and they, and yeah. if you inadvertently use the wrong one, uh, you're, you're, you're a horrible, yeah. horrible person. So. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Another uh, uh, story recently: uh, the, the president, uh, uh, Biden, uh, announced. Uh, that he was going to name an, a uh, put somebody up for uh, the new Supreme Court justice, replace uh, Justice Breyer, mm -hmm. uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. has a lot of experience, etc. But from the pro-life area, there there are a lot of concerns for people. Just to be aware, okay, of the fact that uh, according to SBA, Susan B. Anthony. Uh, mm -hmm. organization they said she's backed by many of America's most radical pro-abortion groups and I thought this was interesting that apparently that in 2001 she co-authored an amicus brief in McGuire versus Riley in support of the Massachusetts law that created the buffer zone remember that uh, preventing yep. pro-life sidewalk counselors from approaching women outside abortion clinics and her clients in the past have mm -hmm. been NARAL an abortion access project of Massachusetts so uh, She'll probably get uh, put on the court, but uh, because of the nature yeah. of the makeup, et cetera, uh, of the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, but that being said, it, it, we need to be aware that that's the reality we're dealing with. Oh, yeah, I think, uh, um, yeah, it'll be uh, definitely another extremist. But uh, let's face it, um, you know, it's kind of a, I don't think it's a net gain for the opposition um, because she's replacing somebody who's, uh, pretty much voted in the uh, other direction. Right. I mean, the same direction over the course of many, many years. Um, I do think she, I don't think she's going to be in charge of writing a decision mm -hmm. for a while. Uh, so uh, 
um, you know, um, you know, my thought along the lines is, I mean, I fully expect that that's what would have happened, and um, I, you know, I'm not surprised that this is the candidate that that has been put up. Uh, like I said, there's so little regard for life, and now in order to make sure you can have as much death as possible, mm -hmm. you now have to start f threatening religious liberties um, in order to do it. Right. So I think uh, that's part of the uh, the package we can expect. Right. But we do have a, a good complement of Supreme Court justices right. uh, that uh, will um, be able to, I think, uh, appropriately um, uh, weigh in. Uh, to protect life in the upcoming Yeah, months. between uh, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, mm -hmm. and Barrett, I mean, uh, you know, people can quibble mm -hmm. about things, but uh, when you compare them to someone and like Alito, this's position uh, on yeah. these things, you yeah. know, you realize mm -hmm. how lucky we were in a lot of ways that there was an opportunity for three people to be named during the last administration. So, yeah, absolutely. regardless of one's absolutely. perspective on uh, President Trump mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah, it, yeah. Here's another, uh, I thought, interesting article. You love surveys mm -hmm. and statistics and things, so uh, this mm -hmm. one was posted by our friends over at Catholic Answers, and it was talking about uh -huh. uh, proponents of early childhood education, and the results were stunning. Apparently there was a survey that was done in Tennessee, and uh -huh. uh, what their results are, it was all about pre-K. Everybody's got to go to pre-K, yeah. kind of like what, what uh, Biden, President Biden's been talking about and things. They yeah. said what they surprised by, that by sixth grade, the students had gone through the pre-K were underperforming in math, science, and reading compared to the control group who didn't go through that, who stayed home, you know, uh, and went the more normal way. The differences in outcomes mm -hmm. were not only academic, but also behavioral. And with the pre-K yeah. group consistently more likely to need special ed or require disciplinary actions for minor and major violations and uh, one of the uh, proponents mm -hmm. of it uh, you know said it really requires a lot of soul searching but of course the answer of course is it's uh, we just need to do more of it you know it's, it must be something wrong with the quality of, of, of what we're doing you know <laughs> we're not doing enough quantity but this the author of this <laughs> whose uh, name escapes me she said that and I thought this was really good she said my four-year-olds just need their mothers far more than a classroom after all in the family, That's you can best guarantee that the caretaker will be eminently more invested in the flourishing of a child than anyone for hire. This is quality control at its finest. Yeah, I think she's right on the marker. I mean, I think it's not just the love of the mo uh, mother. I think it's the instruction of the father and the influence of the father at an age when value, you know, um, appropriation becomes more and more important and where you're really laying the foundation for religion and the foundation for value and let's uh, values and let's face facts that when religion and and value appropriation is high the personality is far more stable that's not just true in adults it's also true in children and once you have a more stable personality, uh, they're going to be much more able to learn. And, and so, um, in, in a way, uh, you know, what distracts a lot of kids, mm -hmm. what makes a lot of kids, you know, hyperactive, is they, they do really, you know, uh, are, you know, some of them, of course, do have biochemical difficulties, but many of them uh, just have no sense of an ultimate meaning or an ultimate hope or an ultimate dignity, you know, that religious kids and kids who have a, a real sense of, of value, something that makes a difference beyond themselves, have and that really does stabilize the personality it's i mean the primary factor is a good marriage right mm. i mean divorce really destabilizes but once you get past that religion and values are very very important in personality stabilization but more than that value appropriation you know the the capacity to obey somebody, to listen to someone, to believe that someone has their best interests at heart, to believe that God has their best interests at heart, which settles them down, and then as they grow a little older, they transform into a sense of meaning. And you say, well, that's just all psychological. No way. There's real grace. Because, of course, when kids are open to grace in their mm -hmm. freedom, 
they are going to get grace because God never denies it. So the idea, you know, is, yeah, this is really uh, what's really necessary, I think, um, in, in, you know, instead of pre-K. Uh, yes, have a, a year of quality love, quality instruction, quality of value uh, and religion appropriation in the family. Mm -hmm. That year, which is really formative because they do have intellectual capacity. They do have intellectual appropriation at the age of four and five. Uh, and rather than send them uh, over into a, a, a school environment, mm -hmm. let them appropriate what they need to appropriate from the, the sense of love of the parents, the sense right. of empathy of the parents, the sense of security from the parents, the sense of uh, security and, and love from their religion, the sense of, of uh, decency from their values. Let them you know, settle on the really, really important things first, mm -hmm. and then they can learn the ABCs. And by the way, you can learn ABCs at home. Right. And by the way, you, you can learn little geography things at home. You can learn how to count at home. You don't have to go to pre-K uh, in an atmosphere, uh, you know, of a classroom uh, to learn those kinds of things. Uh, really basic things mm -hmm. are easily learned at home and are, uh, you know, wh where did we learn them? You know, uh, I learned them at home. Right. You know, right. my mom and dad, you know, to take me through, you know, even dad tried to train me to, to be a good logical arguer mm -hmm. uh, when I was a kid, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work very well, as you can tell. But the, the main thing so is So you were the tried. clubhouse lawyer in the king in, in kindergarten or something there, uh, oh, negotiating I, I with the teacher. You, I was uh, listen, a good negotiation. <laughs> We're getting tired of the snacks around here. We need something yeah. a little different. <laughs> the trouble was, I liked all the snacks. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Always negotiating, right? Yeah. <laughs> so let's move on to some questions people uh, sent us. So because we got a backlog, we can get to more of them on the show. Sure. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, why do people focus on giving up different foods for Lent? After Easter, they go back to eating their chocolate or drinking their coffee, or maybe their beer could be. Uh, I added that. Wouldn't it be better to give up something that would improve your life, such as cursing or pettiness? which you can continue to do after Easter. This is Don. Well, Don, you, you, of course, you can do all those things. I mean, we want to avoid sin as a part of our Lent mm -hmm. ever and always. But the idea of giving up something like a chocolate or something like, uh, you know, a beer at uh, mm -hmm. dinner or something, the whole reason is, is, well, you like it. And what you're doing is you say, Lord, here's my gift to you. Uh, this is something I can just tell you. I gave it up for you. It doesn't have any purpose in this world at all. The purpose it has is to tell you, I love you. I want to be generous to you. And here, I give this to you. It's like a little kid who gives up something, you know, you look at it and it looks kind of trivial, you know. Like mm -hmm. I had my little, you know, 10 cent pen when I was a kid, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I had a friend, he, he, you know, he said, gosh, I don't have a pen. You know, gosh, I don't have a pen. I said, give him the pen, you know. And then I thought, oh, yeah, that's great. You know, <laughs> I did something good, you know. And, and uh, in a way, it's a, an act of generosity. And it's an act of, you know, uh, real love. And, and that in itself makes all the difference before the Lord. The other mm -hmm. thing that really makes a difference be before the Lord too is, um, you know, the idea that, uh, um, you know, uh, you know I, I want to improve. Mm -hmm. And we can do that at the same time. We can be more conscientious about if a person, um, you know, has, you know, difficulties with cursing or has difficulties with, you know, a variety of other things, vanity, will pick your deadly sin, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. Of course, during Lent, we're always trying to move toward uh, moral conversion. And, you know, I try mm -hmm. to emphasize my exam in prayer, which is a prayer which is really oriented right. toward moral conversion in the Lenten season. So right. you can do both. Uh, it's not an either or deal at all. Right, a absolutely. And also, I think on one level, and this isn't the primary one, you know, it, A, when you're reminding yourself, oh, I can't eat that, or, or whatever, you're reminding yourself that there's something more than where you are right now. There's something above you yeah. or greater than you. And when you see another person do it, it reminds you as well. It's kind of like a habit, you know, in the sense of a religious habit, seeing a, a priest in clerics yeah. or in religious, out and about, it, it reminds you that this isn't all there is. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and like I said, you you know, when you love somebody, mm -hmm. you just make sacrifices right. for them. And um, it's just a little proof of love because it's a self-sacrifice for the sake right. of just proving, um, you know, that uh, you know I'm. You know, my satisfaction of my chocolate urge is mm -hmm. not the uh, the ultimate thing in my life. Right, right. You're the ultimate thing in my life, and so here, right. I just give you this as a little self-sacrifice because I love you. Here right. it is. And that is the whole idea behind fasting. It's not to be a great stoic right. uh, or anything else. It's a gift of love well, to yeah, the I Lord. Well, I think you're, you're, you're a prophet. I think the next question is somewhat uh, stoic. Oh. oh. <laughs> anyway, dear Father okay. Spitzer, I'm trying to read the Bible more during Lent. Fasting in the Bible seemed to imply not eating at all. Modern fasting in the church is two small meals along with one regular meal, which is not much of a sacrifice at all. Why the change, Charlotte? Well, Charlotte, you know, um, if you want to do more, you're certainly called to it. But the church um, doesn't try doesn't try to give a standard of an ideal for what you might do during Lent. The church just gives a minimum requirement. Right. And, in, and in so doing, it has to take into consideration, you know, the health or the capacity of many people, uh, you know, to, to uh, engage in this little self-sacrificial act. But the church says, sure, you're always called on to do more. And so we don't just stop at, you know, not eating meat on Friday or uh, fasting two days, you know, Ash Wednesday and, and um, you know, uh, on uh, Good Friday. Mm -hmm. But we also, uh, you know, give, uh, you know, uh, other things. We think of some other things we could give up that we really like, you know. And as I said, you know, I, I like my uh, beer, my occasional beer at dinners. Mm -hmm. And so, I, uh, you know, I give that up. Okay, that's something more or, you know, uh, whatever it may be. So we just try and find some mm -hmm. things um, that we really like that we could, you know, definitely give up and, uh, you know, which don't affect our health ultimately. And, um, you know, most people who are, you know, I'm a few months away for, from 70 and, uh, you know, I, I mean, I could say, well, I'm excused from fasting. But, I mean, it's not going to affect me one bit. So, I, I mean, I, I just want to do it. So we're all called to do uh, what we can do. And sometimes, like I said, the, the, the best thing we can do is to try and figure out some ways where we could, you know, you know uh, really strengthen our moral conversion. Um, and that might, you know, to, you know, as it were, the best mm -hmm. thing to give up for Lent to sin. You know, and so uh, that's always our primary purpose is to try to do that. But, you know, these other little things besides are not the whole point of Lent. They're, uh, they're really uh, something that we add on as a mm -hmm. little self-sacrifice for the sake of love. Right. Here's another question. Dear Father Spitzer, I have the opposite problem many Catholics have. Instead of my children leaving the church, my parents have left. They raised me Catholic as my husband and I are now raising our children. However, my parents have become more and more secular to where they no longer seem to practice any faith. Is there anything I can say to them? Sarah. Wow. Well, you know, um, secularization happens. I mean, it's, I think it's the great plot of the devil, as we'll talk about later in the program. I think he does work through the culture and uh, remarkable ways mm -hmm. and what begins to happen is we begin to um, sacrifice our um, our morals mm -hmm. and the rationalizations provided by the evil spirit seem to be sufficient uh, for uh, throwing our morals out the window but one of the things that you know you know something is amiss when people say I don't have to go to church uh, on a weekly basis. There's nothing I really need to be thankful for. I kind of did it all myself. And there's nothing I would ask the Lord for on behalf, not just m of me, but on behalf of my kids or something of that nature. There's just nothing hmm. I, I need to be thankful for. There's nothing I need to ask for somebody else. There's nothing uh, you know, uh, in me where I have to get right with the Lord uh, through maybe the forgiveness of my venial hmm. sins and Holy Communion. Uh, there's no nothing I really need to give praise to God for. I mean, uh, I'm just uh, so about me. That's the problem, mm -hmm. is that uh, when I um, uh, don't thank God anymore, I put myself in the center of the universe, and that's a real tough thing. 
I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, if people actually can't think of a reason to go to mass, I, I give them a book by Christopher Lash called The Culture of Narcissism. Hmm. And the reason I do is because when you don't think that there's anything you need to thank God for, if you really don't think you need to give praise to God for the glory of your soul, the glory of your family, the glory of the things around you, even the nature around you, if you don't think that you have some reconciliation to do with God on a weekly basis by just, you know, saying, you know, we have opportunity three times during our Mass to not only ask for forgiveness for our sins, but to actually give, get some form of a, a kind of, you know, may, may the Lord, you know, uh, you know, uh, forgive you for your sins, some mm -hmm. formula along those lines. In our Mass, you know, that, that uh, um, you know, the, that we avail ourselves of because we do fail in our lives. If you don't think you have any of those things, wow, you know, think of, I mean, it's called creeping narcissism, boy. You know, this ought to scare the living daylights out of you. Mm -hmm. and, and if it doesn't scare the living daylights out of you, maybe you're further along in the narcissistic move than you think. Mm -hmm. and, and so my thought would be is I'd probably, you know, there's a lot of good books about, you know, a personality, you know, like a narcissistic personality. But, you know, I, I would say that one of the things that's very clear there is that uh, uh, God's out of the picture so that I can be in the center of my own universe and try to be the center of everybody else's universe, too. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the ultimate goal of the narcissist. So, I mean, I, 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 you know, what can I tell you? I think adults ought to know this. Right. I, I really do. And so the catechesis may not be so much, you know, proving the existence of God, which I right. do with young people. Right. That's very legitimate. Or, you know, showing that you have an immortal soul which is going to survive bodily death and you're going to meet the Lord or you may meet the darker forces. You know, now sometimes the threat of evil does get to people. Mm -hmm. And one thing I would just say is if you notice and, you know, if you notice that you, you get a sense of depression and anxiety that is continuing to increase. And if you notice that you have a sense of dread uh, in your life, that you have lost your sense of the absolute, mm -hmm. that you have lost your sense of absolute meaning as well, if you're starting to get these symptoms, and if you all of a sudden feel like uh, you are almost open uh, you know, to uh, an evil spirit um, uh, working against you, even seducing you into his own domain. If that comes about and you start getting scared because you, you see these things happening, you know, you don't know what the source of this emptiness and alienation and loneliness is. You don't mm -hmm. know, you know, why do I have this sense of dread that somehow, you know, I, I'm vulnerable to, uh, to evil. If you don't have this sense of ordinary guilt in your life, you know, for things that are going awry and you've got it all justified out there. You know, if you, you know, if you've got, you know, these things, these symptoms happening in your life, you know, you, mm -hmm. you want to go to church in a hurry because mm -hmm. you're really getting influenced by that dark spirit. Mm -hmm. And you really are being right. influenced by that dark spirit. And you may laugh it off now, but you will not laugh it off as the symptoms increase. And they will increase mm -hmm. because he always comes to claim his victim and he's not going to wait until you're you know you're uh, you're catapulting uh, into his domain he's going to wait and try and take some of the dividends right now mm -hmm. so you can expect that these things will happen and when they do just go back to the lord who loves you mm -hmm. just go back to the sacrament of reconciliation go back to the blessed virgin mary go back to the lord who wants to bring you into the fullness of his light and joy don't stay in the darkness and real darkness is ingratitude and real darkness is believing that i don't have to thank anybody for anything and real, i did it all myself and real right. darkness is when we think we're our own messiah and real real darkness is when we think we're a messiah for others so all this stuff i'm telling you you know it just creeps right. up on you he's such a subtle little uh you know uh spirit you know that evil spirit but at the same time i'm telling right. you 
One day he will come to claim the dividends. Right. And then he'll come to claim the full price. Unfortunately, many times uh, when people are, are, are in the older age brackets, when the health starts to fail, that they start thinking yep. twice. You don't wish that on anybody. That's right. But it happens a lot. With that being said, yep. we'll be have much more with Father Spitzer after this very <laughs> short break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Father Spitzer's Universe, part two here, second part of the show. And besides all those great books Father Spitzer has at our religious catalog, a couple of other ones we wanted to point out. Two great books for Lent, with still early, Making a Holy Lent by Father William Casey, and also Four Last Things by Father Wade Menezes, both powerful Mercy Fathers. Both books available through the EWTN religious catalog, EWTNRC.com for all things Catholic and most things Spitzer as well. And now we're back with uh, Father Spitzer. Is he coming to view? There he is. I see him now on, 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 on our viewer screen here. So here's a couple more questions before we get to the book. A uh, person wrote to us, uh, Dear Father Spitzer, my daughter and other young people attend the traditional Latin Mass. They're concerned mm -hmm. about the restrictions now being put in place in different areas. Some are thinking about leaving the Catholic Church and joining the Orthodox Church. What do you think? Mary. I think that's a horrible idea. I mean... Uh, First of all, the, you know, the, the Roman Catholic Church is certainly, you know, has got, uh, you know, not only a, a richest of imaginable uh, tradition and the richest imaginable doctrinal articulation, uh, but of course, you know, this is your community. It has been your community from, you know, the, the very, uh, you know, uh, get-go of your life. Uh, why would you... You know, I mean, switch churches to, to the Orthodox Church at this point. I mean, the Orthodox Church is a great church, mm. but why would you do that? I mean, um, I, I think your, your best thing to do, um, you know, if you got to, you know, you know, get something that, you know, uh, has less restrictions, maybe go to a uniate uh, uh, church. At least they're right. in communion with Rome, uh, but have a different ritual. But, but uh, I mean, these restrictions are going to go by the wayside very soon. Uh, COVID is uh, literally, the cases are dropping down. There is a, a, certainly a possibility that there'll be another variant. But honestly, it looks like the mutations are getting weaker and weaker and it looks like there's a herd immunity out there. So there's a very good possibility that there's not going to be a lot of restrictions going forward in the mm -hmm. future. So if that's the case, stick with where you are and uh, don't, don't be doing, you know, radical things like switching, uh, you know, to a, a different tradition with a different canon law and so forth and so on. Stick with uh, what you've got going there um, and... Um, uh, with the, you know, you can find a traditional church. You already are going to a Latin mass. Stick with that Latin mass. I think it'll be just mm -hmm. fine. The restrictions will, I think, soon be over. Right, and also I know the fraternity of St. Peter it was conferred that yeah. they can continue to do it, and and we'll see where yep. these things go. And like you said, and I think Ignatius always said, you know, when something happens or there's a big thing in your life. The first thing you do is don't change things. You wait, right? Yep, exactly, exactly. And uh, as he, as he would put it, uh, if you're in a sense of uh, desolation, mm -hmm. right, a decrease in trust or hope or love, you know, and you've got all, you know, a, a sense of real sort of darkness or, mm -hmm. you know, you know, feeling of isolation from God, etc. The last thing you want to do is make a radical change. Right. And um, so he basically says, do not make any important decisions. And changing your religion is a really important right. decision. Absolutely. Do not make your any important decisions in time of desolation. Right. Very good. Here's another question. Dear Father Spitzer, in Luke chapter 9, a disciple wants to bury his father before following Jesus. Jesus replies to let the dead bury the dead. However, the church considers burying the dead a corporal work of mercy. This seems contradictory. Jake. Well, Jake, that's a very good question, uh, but you have to learn how uh, rabbis speak. And, um, you, know, they, they, you know, they do it 
uh, yes, in parables, that is true, but, um, you know, they have a lot of hyperboles mm -hmm. as well. So parabolically, hyperbolically, that's very, very normal for a rabbi of the first century. And Jesus, of course, you know, is, is looked at as a teacher. He's following those rhetorical rules. So, you know, when Jesus says, hey, you know, uh, um, it's easier for a, a rich man um, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. You've got to be careful about looking at that in a literal sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but uh, why did Jesus do that? Why did he use a hyperbolic expression? Of course, uh, I mean, if you took that literally, it'd mean all rich men are, are going to be condemned, and that's the end of that, because camels aren't going to go through the eyes of a mm -hmm. needle anytime soon. So uh, did Jesus intend to say all rich people are going to hell. No, of course he didn't do that. Why did he do it? Because at the time there is something that um, um, is, uh, uh, let's call it an assumption that is made. If you have wealth, that means you are favored or graced by God. Mm -hmm. Now that was the assumption. But then of course Jesus says, no, that's not true. He, so he's going to uh, break apart that assumption and the best way to do it as you use a hyper, uh, that's an exaggerated expression. Mm -hmm. So you basically say something in an exaggerated manner, and the person who's used to listening to a rabbi hears that hyperbolic analogy, and he goes, oh, this is something I have to pay attention to. Riches aren't going to get me through the door. That's not a guarantee that I'm living a graced life. And then Jesus goes to the opposite extreme. He goes all the way to the extreme of saying, in fact, it's not just that riches might not guarantee you, it's in fact that riches might hinder you from getting into the kingdom of God, which is Jesus' backdoor way of saying what? Hey, those people who don't have riches might be better off for their eternal mm -hmm. salvation than those who have riches and are distracted by them. Right. Or he's saying, hey, that those who don't have all the talents and gifts or have all the family disposition or something uh, that other people do, or those who might be suffering from some challenge in their lives, right? They might not be worse off in terms of their eternal salvation, then the person who has everything, has all the talents, has all the intellectual ability, has all the athletic ability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which are all quote unquote riches in that Semitic way. So the whole point, let's get back to burying, let the dead bury the dead. What can that mean? Mm -hmm. Of course, burying the dead is very, uh, uh, you know, it's a holy thing. It's a very important ritual in first century. And you are absolutely correct in saying this. But why would Jesus almost seem like, wow, let the dead bury the dead? It mm -hmm. seems so callous. To our ears, yes. But what does it mean to that first century Semite? Wait a minute. If something that holy, like burying the dead, does it pales by comparison to following him, mm -hmm. aha! Now we get it. So he takes something holy, and he's not trying to bring a holy thing down, like, right? Mm -hmm. He's not trying to bring a holy thing down. He's trying to say, if that takes second place to, and he's using a hyperbole, he's using an exaggeration, if that thing takes second place by a long shot, there's the hyperbole, right? To, by a long shot to following Jesus, what's the message? Mm -hmm. Follow Jesus. That's your priority. That's where you got to put your priority. Even above things that seem really, really holy, but pale mm -hmm. by comparison. So this is very typically rabbinical uh, of, uh, you know, view of things in the first century. So that's why uh, he mm -hmm. did it. He, he's not trying to bring down the holiness of burial or anything of that okay. nature. It, the person in the context would have understood it in the first century. Semitic culture would have understood it um, the right way. Okay, very good. And a final question before we get to the book. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, at the incarnation, Jesus assumed our human nature becoming fully human and fully God. Did his death on the uh -huh. cross end his humanity? I was told that at his resurrection, he resumed being only fully God as before the incarnation. This is Marian. No, that's not true. Actually, uh, Jesus, uh, right in his risen appearance, of course, he has a transformed embodiment, but he still maintains that mediative 
uh, secondary power. So yes, of course, he's fully God, uh, and he always was fully God, but he uh, remains transformed now. He remains in his uh, risen embodiment um, that is still hypostatically united with his divinity. Um, and so, of course, uh, he does that as a mediator uh, for the whole church. And so his risen body becomes actually the substance through which we are all united in what is called the mystical body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So he maintains that to be the ultimate mediator, to be the ultimate ground of the church, to be the ultimate unifier and source of grace and source of the Holy Spirit for all those who are in the church, such that one thing, that if we do one thing that's good, everybody else benefits through him, through his risen mediative body. And if we do th one thing wrong, it affects the whole, as uh, St. Paul tells us. So that's basically um, the key mm -hmm. thought um, there. And uh, so he does maintain his body. So he, fully uh, divine does not mean no longer human. Okay. Remember, the whole idea of the hypostatic union is true God, fully God, and true man, fully man. Now he's fully man in his risen and glorified and mediative and almost, you know, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> infinitely extensive uh, embodiment. He is still embodied in that sense. Um, and so he is um, there to mediate us to one another and to his father forever. Okay, very good. Let's go to the book. Christ versus Satan in our daily lives. Of course, uh, we were in chapter uh, four, uh, page 188, bottom of 188. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was interesting here, and you've said this before, but you say, you talk about the evil one. He comes to a person who is beginning a life of spiritual and moral maturity by di d disguising himself as an angel of light, which we've heard from Scripture too. Mm -hmm. and, and th but this mm -hmm. is always the interesting part that you make, out, that he makes suggestions that seem right. How so? Yeah. So, okay, let's suppose you have really embarked on um, a spiritual life, and by maturity, I mean you're starting to get pretty good at resisting temptation. Mm -hmm. So last week I was talking a little bit about that ability to say, I hate this temptation instead of entertaining it, or I hate the darkness behind this intention, the evil spirit behind this intention, and sort of, uh, instead of letting him sort of provide a rationalization and le lead me down the primrose path, or ignoring his presence, you know, like he's not there, you know, trying to fully stoke up the sin. So the idea, you know, is I'm not going to blind myself to this anymore. I am choosing sides. So you get pretty good at resisting temptation once you start to say, I'm choosing sides. I'm, I'm hating this temptation, mm -hmm. and I'm hating the, the cause of the temptation. I'm, you know, I'm resisting it. So now you've got a point where you are resisting that temptation. Now, what is, the, the key thing that we have to remember, though, is that the devil goes, okay, so now Spitzer, he's starting to get pretty good at this, and he really means it. And he could improve, and if he does improve, uh-oh, he's going to help a lot of other people uh, to get into the kingdom of heaven. He's now um, enemy number, well, one billion, because, of course, I'll never be public enemy number one. I'd leave that for the real saints, uh, for the devil. But he's going to be, a tr he's gonna be a, uh, as, as they say in the Clint, Clint Eastwood movie, he's going to be trouble. Now, the <laughs> point, of course, is once he's figured that out, right, that you're going to be trouble, um, you know, he, he's got to get to you still. Mm -hmm. So how does he do it? He goes, hey, Spitzer, you know, <laughs> I totally agree. What, you are really trying to resist temptations. Way to go. But, you know, you're kind of slow at it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, these incremental improvements, they're, they're a little bit, you know, uh, uh, paltry. <laughs> Let's face facts. I, I need something a little bit better. I need something a little bit faster. And I want something that's a little bit more than you're doing right now. And frankly, I, I'd like to make it a little bit harder. So, you know, I, I want you to just kind of 
push yourself a little bit, you know, lazy slaggers. Mm -hmm. You know, just keep, you know, pushing yourself a little bit. And of course, you go, okay, you know, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll push myself. And now maybe I can get rid of all seven deadly sins. I can do it in one fell swoop by next week. And of course, this is right. not going to happen. So, of course, but the new person right on the block thinks that this is a really good thing to do. And so you try to do it, and of course, you're going to flop on your face in five minutes. The minute you flop on your face, you give up. Aha! There's the prize for the evil spirit. He wants you not only to give up, he wants you to give up with discouragement and not only give up with discouragement, but think that God is an ogre who expects too much of you and you could never possibly have done it. And then to finally say at the end of it all, all you want is more and better and harder and faster. Who can possibly do this? Well, more, better, faster and harder. That's not God's rhetoric. God wants to get you to the goal. Who is screaming at you harder, faster, more, better? I'm never satisfied, you slaggard. I'm never satisfied. Okay, who's saying that? Evil spirit. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he's tempting you to think that it's the voice of God. He's tempting you to think that this is what God wants from you. But it's not what God wants from you at all. And then he deceives you by coming as an angel of light. Mm -hmm. He's then got you discouraged. He's then got you given up. And he's then got you thinking that God is an ogre. And once he's got you in all three camps, he's just pleased as punch. Because where are you going to go now? Mm -hmm. You're going to probably go right back from where you came. And that means back to, you know, the, what right. St. Ignatius would call the first week of the exercises. And that discouragement can be so horrible. So um, remember right. Chesterton's and then you give up. Adage. You say, well, I keep trying, yeah. and no matter what I do, it's, this is never going to work, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm just, it's just never going to work. And so the, the, remember Chesterton, every heresy is merely an exaggeration of the truth. truth right, and right. the devil is really an expert at it. He's just going to get you to exaggerate one part of a doctrine. So, you know, if I get you to exaggerate, you know, you say, Jesus Christ is true God and true man. But then I go, go hey, you know, if you say that Christ is uh, uh, felt pain on the cross, you're not really believing that he's truly divine. And so I push you mm. and I push you and it seems right, mm. right? And I keep pushing you until you finally say, well, you know, gee, you know, Jesus really wasn't human. I mean, he didn't feel pain at all. He, he, he basically, you know, he was in the, the appearance of human. What God would give himself up totally so that he could feel pain? What a strange, odd thing that would be. And, of course, you're off on the primrose path right. to heresy, and that's why you got so many Arians in the world, right? right. I mean, or so Absolutely. many monophysites in the world. I mean, you just did uh, take your... Uh, your, your uh, pick. But I mean, the, right. the main thing in point is the devil's always trying to do that. But if you're in the second week, if you're starting to get good with resisting temptation, if you're starting to get a sense of real mission and wanting to help people and help lead people closer to Christ, as you're getting this, the devil has got to think up another strategy. And his general strategy, as St. Paul tells us, St. Ignatius tells us, is to come appearing as an angel of light mm -hmm. with a good suggestion. But the good suggestion is really an exaggeration of one part of the truth. And once he's got you exaggerating that one part of the truth, then all the other parts of that truth are now eclipsed. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, you're at an extreme and you're going to do something probably really dumb. And just remember, you say, well, that's only the truth. I mean, it's not affecting my actions. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm telling you this right now. The reason we have dogmas, the reason that we have doctrines is because belief does affect action, as St. John Paul is always trying to tell us all the time. If very, you have wrong beliefs, it's going to eventually lead to a wrong interpretation of moral doctrine, which is in turn going to lead to a very wrong um, uh, life or a practice um, uh, you know, of, of, right. uh, in life. And that uh, practical uh, thing is probably going to lead towards right. sin. Now you say, uh, further down the page, you talk about this, 
there's this obvious struggle between good and evil that's, that's going on that you're mm -hmm. involved in, obviously, this angel light. You also talk about mm -hmm. the fact of, of people, uh, or the signs of the struggle being the fact that people are overwhelmed by t temptations. And just th that whole idea, and you, mm -hmm. and you use that word several times in the book, that a lot of people today just feel overwhelmed in general. Yeah, they do. And, and of course, uh, and the overwhelmed by temptation, it's there because, of course, it's in front of you everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. I mean, I consider myself fortunate to be blind mm -hmm. because I don't have to look at all that stuff on the Internet, you know, that, you know, they can tempt you with every deadly sin. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's vanity writ large, there's pride writ large, there's lust writ large, there's greed writ large, there's everything writ large. I mean, it's just everywhere you turn. And then, of course, you know, the, the Facebook, the whole of social media is one big, gigantic, you know, vanity machine. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. uh, unbelievable. And, and so when you're when you're looking at this, I mean, of course you feel overwhelmed. It's like who can resist it all? And y you know, you you don't get overwhelmed. That's the main point of what I'm trying to say is mm -hmm. if you get overwhelmed, you're going to give up and right. that's the last thing you want to do. So the first thing is take it one step at a time. Find some things that you can do, especially in an area where you feel very vulnerable. So let's suppose you like dresses and jewelry or something, and you feel very vulnerable to that sort of thing, mm -hmm. you know, and you just got to get a, a new dress or something beautiful every time you turn around. Okay, start working on a little thing you could do to temper that mm -hmm. particular thing. Or let's suppose, you know, you are so ultra competitive with everybody around you and you got to tell everybody just how great you are. So it's a little bit of a vanity problem on that level or a pride mm -hmm. problem on that level. Uh, the same thing. You just try and start doing something small. Little baby steps, as I used to uh, call them until What About Bob came out, which I'll never use that term <laughs> okay. again. Okay. So, but uh, but uh, the main thing is, uh, you know, you just want to take very small steps to trying to curb that slowly but surely, but it will work. You start you taking those steps and you really mm -hmm. start, as I say, hating the temptation you will see that um, those things no longer become tempting to you because you see that they're really uh, interfering with your relationship with the Lord and your relationship with the Blessed Mother. And the main thing that you want to do is just keep that up. Keep mm -hmm. the pressure up. And, you know, vigilance, vigilance, vigilance is what Jesus says. But do it in small steps. Mm -hmm. And this you can do. But start with the ones you're most vulnerable to first and then kind of move into the ones where you're less vulnerable, right? So that's the, the idea, um, you know, behind it. And you go, well, will I ever get there? Of course you'll get there. Mm -hmm. If you keep on the road, it, at the end of the day, Jesus, even if you're in purgatory, Jesus will finally see that glimmer of freedom in you, seize the opportunity, and whoosh, just yank you right into the kingdom of God. So it's going to work out in the long run. Don't get discouraged that it's taking too long, but keep vigilant. Keep up the pressure. Keep hating the temptation. And eventually you'll see right. that this thing becomes weaker and weaker. Then you can move on to the next. But one of the um, things temptation. it seems like in the world we live in today in the last minute or so is the idea that, you know, nobody has any patience anymore anyway yeah yeah no that's true everybody is you know the fam famous expression these days is yeah 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 yeah. Right. I mean it's just like oh my gosh if you say that one more time I mean even if I'm on a plane and I hear these conversations going on where these guys are just writing off people but yeah 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 right in the middle of the sentence you, you feel like saying shut up you know and I turn impatient right in the middle of it because it's just like oh my gosh you father know, you were not and, supposed and to tell that story about me on that plane ride we had that, 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 that was not <laughs> yeah <laughs> You promised you wouldn't. 
<laughs> oh, I know. But anyway, in the last second, I'll just simply say, yeah, there is a huge uh, amount of impatience. And I think one thing we can really start with is don't let yourself appropriate the impatience of the culture. It really is out there. I am so prone to impatience mm -hmm. in my own life. And the least stimulus, right, you, you just want to go right to it right. like a dog to a bone. <laughs> and the main thing is try to resist it and just know that love is patient and know Jesus' patience toward his disciples and just try to imitate that patience um, that he had, you know, with Peter and with Philip. I mean, what a crew, you know, but he does. Absolutely. He just loves them very much in that patience and imitate that love of Christ. Yeah, 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 I got it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, if you, but if now you give us your blessing, I could use it. Uh, very good. Okay. And bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord in this Lenten season who bestows upon us the blessing of continued conversion, of desire to be closer uh, to him, it, give you the grace and the freedom to move ever more closely and diligently and vigilantly toward that ideal which he expressed in his own life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for all your wisdom, Father Spitzer. We shall see you next week. And don't forget, uh -huh. Father Spitzer's books and videos available through our EWT and Religious Catalog. Next week, we continue with How the Devil Works. Father's got some great insights. Uh, bookmark this weekend, The Decline and Fall of Sacred Scripture, How the Bible Became a Secular Book by Ben Weicker and co-authored with Scott Hahn. It was a very really exciting interview. Check that out. And also this week, the one and only uh, Father Mitch Packwell welcomes the Catholic League's Bill Donahue discussion based on his book, having to deal with the problems of the church and, and also having to do with clergy abuse. And that's tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern. Re-airs throughout the week, always on EWTN On Demand, where you can find almost all our great programs. And this is Doug Keck. Thank you so much for joining us. We shall see you next time in Father Spitzer's universe.